Abuju, Anin, Michael Price was a Gishi condition because we quimikong manitou minas sindun jiba makwa nin to dem. Gawaba begani kag in dayan nungum. Um, my name is Michael Price, Wasagijik. I just introduced myself in my native language, the, the Anishinaabe. And sorry, I'm a little distracted here because it is light here. It's very bright. But uh, um, I worked at tribal colleges for most of my professional career. And I saw a huge need to, to go out and to learn this knowledge and, and to try to revive it for, for the next generation of Anishinaabe students. A lot of them had never even knew of the, of the star, not that Anishinaabe people had their own star knowledge. And they never knew that, um, that there were philosophers and astronomers and great thinkers uh, within their ancestral community. And so part of the reason why I wanted to go on this journey was, was to, to try to bring back this knowledge as a gift to them and, uh, and to add to my work uh, as a faculty member. <clears throat> So the title of my presentation, Underwater Panthers, Thunderbirds, and Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Star Knowledge, I tried to pick out some of the stories that, 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 that really jumped out in, in, this, in this journey to, to learn the knowledge. And there's a whole lot more knowledge here that I didn't include. But um, I hope this kind of gives you a feel for, for how they seen and, and understood uh, the star world. So just... Thank you. So just to give you um, a little, little idea of where the Anishinaabe people are from, here's a map of uh, Anishinaabe country. And if you see the, uh, the large reservation down here, this, this is the White Earth Reservation. This is where I live right now. Um, but actually, my family is from this large island right here in northern Lake Huron called Manitoulin Island. And that's where most of my uh, seven generations of my family are from. But all along the Great Lakes, all around the Great Lakes, is, is the land of the Anishinaabe people. Um, also the Cree, the, uh, the Odawa, the Chippewa, or the Ojibwe, uh, the Menominee. Now, we are all Anishinaabe people uh, in that nation. So I'm going to uh, share with you some of the, the star stories. And I know that you'll recognize some of these, these constellations. And what became really fascinating to me was when I, I've always known these as the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, but when I began to hear these names spoken in the Ojibwe language, it was really exciting for me uh, to have learned this knowledge. So we'll start with the, um, what most of us have seen as the, uh, or know as the Big Dipper. And this is what we call in Ojibwe, Ojig. Ojig is a, uh, a member of the weasel family. It is a carnivore that lives in the forest. Uh, it has a long tail and a very respected hunter uh, that, that, that the Anishinaabe recognize. And here's a picture of an actual fisher that, that lives in the North Woods. A very beautiful animal, and it is actually one of the only mammals that, that has the ability to hunt and kill porcupines. So it uh, has that gift that no other uh, carnivorous mammal has. But going back to this story, uh, the fisher, and I want to try to, to tell the story in the way that I've heard it told to me, uh, the story of how the fisher uh, got the arrow in its tail. A long time ago, um, when the springs came and the trees began to green up, this was back in a time when the animals could communicate to one another. Um, a lot of the animals realized that the birds did not return one year. And so a lot of the animals were concerned and they began to gather together and ask one another, why haven't the birds returned this year? And then the bear looked up in the sky and, and saw that the birds were being, were flying up into a hole in the sky, or what we call a bagune gizik. And that the, the birds were flying into the hole and they were disappearing. And so the animals gathered together and they began to ask one another, we need to investigate and see what's happening to our relatives, the birds. So they went and found the tallest cedar tree they could find in the forest. And then they began to deliberate with one another. Well, who's going to climb this tree and investigate? 
So among all of the tree climbing mammals, they all got together and talked, and the bear said, well, I can't because I'm too big. And the porcupine said, well, I can't because I'm too timid. And all the animals found reasons why they couldn't do it. And finally, the fisher, Ojig, said, I'll climb up there, and I will find out what is going on, what is happening to the birds. So the fisher began to climb the cedar tree and climbed to the very tops of his limbs until finally the limbs are so thin that it became wobbly. And then with one great leap, the fisher jumped from the top of the trees and into the Bhaganagizhik, the hole in the sky. And now the fisher was in the cloud world. And what the fisher found was that this angry cloud spirit was holding the birds captive. It had hundreds of thousands of birds that it held captive inside these small clouds. And this angry cloud spirit kept forming more clouds which to, to trap more birds. So finally the little fisher ran up to one of those clouds and began to spin its tail and he dissolved one cloud. And finally a whole flock of birds flew away, flew in through the Bhaganagizhik and back to earth. Then the little fisher began to release more birds and more birds. And he was working, spinning his tail to dissolve these clouds and, and, the, and the birds were escaping back down to earth. Well, finally, the angry cloud spirit saw what the fisher was doing, and the angry cloud spirit reached in and grabbed a bow and an arrow and shot at the fisher. But the fisher just kept spinning his tail and kept dissolving these clouds, releasing all the birds, until finally, the last cloud that was released, the birds flew through the hole in the sky, and the little fisher ran for the hole in the sky as well. And just as the fisher began to leap through the hole, an arrow hit the fisher in the tail, and he lunged and grabbed for the top limb and missed it. And the poor fisher fell to the earth, and unfortunately he died. A lot of the animals and the birds, they gathered around the, the little fisher's body. And they recognized the bravery that this little animal had done to bring back the birds of the spring. And the great spirit was watching this whole scenario take place. So the great spirit reached down onto the earth and picked up nine stones and threw them into the sky. And those stones formed a star constellation that would always immortalize and, and remember the bravery that the fisher did in bringing back the birds. So that's the story of Ojig, the fisher. And these, oh, thank you. Miigwech. So the two stars that you see in his tail are, are very dim, but they're there. And so the, this, a very prominent star constellation and a story among the Anishinaabe people. The next constellation that I want to bring up was the Mong, or the, or the Great Northern Loon. And this is actually the Little Dipper upside down. And if you look at it, it looks exactly like a loon floating on top of the water. And, of course, here's a picture. For those of you who haven't seen the great loon up close, uh, this is a picture of Mong. And if you notice um, the, the, the spots in, on the loon's back, they say that the people that are born of the loon clan actually have a, a connection to the star world, and it is represented on the, the, on the loon's back. So those are star representations uh, on the back of the loon. And of course, here's the two constellations together. A story that I learned from Bob Jourdain was that Polaris, which is the North Star, is actually in the Ojibwe language called Ojiganung, which is the, uh, the Fisher Star. And throughout the year, the Fisher constellation will, revol will revolve around the North Star all throughout the year. The Fisher constellation will be in different parts of the sky in different parts of the season. And a lot of Anishinaabe people were able to read uh, that, that movement, just like a clock. So I know many of you will probably know this constellation. The tail of the, or, or the head of Leo is actually the, the tail of the, the great underwater panther, Mishia Bijou. And this is a very formidable spirit among the Anishinaabe people. This is a spirit that lives underneath the waters and wherever there's turbulent water or whirlpools, they say that's where these panthers reside. And a lot of Anishinaabe people, before they went out in their canoes, they gave tobacco 
asema to the spirits for a safe journey and basically to appease these spirits that they wouldn't capsize their canoes and, and pull them underneath the water. So this is a very formidable um, uh, spirit that uh, the Anishinaabe people respect. And this is the constellation. This is actually a spring constellation that comes up, um, I believe, in, at the end of March. And what's ironic about that time is that that's about the time that the ice is beginning to break up and melt uh, in the north, northern part of uh, Minnesota. And so it becomes very dangerous up there during that time where there's thin ice. And so we always recognize uh, that this constellation, it, it tells us to, to be careful and to be cautious when we're out on the waters and to always uh, give tobacco to appease uh, those spirits. So these are some rock paintings, and for those of you that have toured around Canada on the north shore of Lake Superior have probably seen this. This is the great Mishibiju that's painted on the, the rocks um, on uh, Agawa Bay, uh, northern Lake Superior. <clears throat> and you can see the, the horns and the, and the spikes. I mean, it, it was made to be a very formidable uh, spirit. And if you look over on the far left, you'll see a canoe that's full of people. And of course, down below, I asked an elder what those two uh, beings were below the Mishibiju. And he said those is what I, what I would call Zagasqua Jemeg, or giant leeches. So this pictograph that I believe was meant to be a warning, and the little picture down on the right there, that's my little boy at the, at the rock painting site. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the rocks here, Right up here is where the painting is. And down here is just kind of this, this rock uh, slant. And when the waves are really high, uh, it's very dangerous out there. And, and if somebody was to fall off into that water when the waves were up, it would be life-threatening. And I believe that's why that these ancient uh, people uh, put this painting here as, as a warning to be careful uh, in, this, in this area. Of course, the day that we took this, this picture, it was a nice, calm day, but the day before, uh, we could have never gotten out there because it was really dangerous. This is another rock painting of a Mishibiju uh, uh, near, um, up in the Boundary Waters uh, uh, wilderness area in northern Minnesota. This is probably almost 200 miles from the other painting at, at Agawa Bay. And as you can see, it's starting to fade a little bit, but you can see the long tail that comes over its back, and you can see the two horns uh, coming off of its head. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the rock is beginning to chip away. So uh, it, I don't know how much longer we'll be able to have and, and see these paintings with the rock the way it's flaking as it is. And this is obviously a very old uh, rock painting. 